Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Are we good? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Have a seat. <laughs> Hello. My name is Natalie. I'm on the screen, you'll see Delport and Lowe, I think. Oh, no, yeah. So uh, industry just knows me as Delport. And then I put Lemises because she's in the audience. And I'm going to refer to her with a few of the things that I'm going to talk about. Lemise is the uh, managing director, CEO, runner of Ikasi, <laughs> and Lika Burning as well. They're the both directors of the um, company. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It is a bit um, noisy out there, and I am going to show a video in a few minutes. So if it isn't audible, as audible as you'd like it to be, we do have videos on the Ikasi website. So um, if it gets too loud on the outside, I'm just going to jump past the video. Okay, cool. I mean, you do have headsets as well if you want to cancel out. Where are we now? We good? You can put the headsets on if it helps you. It is active, Jody. The headsets are active. Okay, so if you want to cancel out the noise, that does help. I'll give you a moment to put that on. Much better, eh? <laughs> Good. You need to put it on, eh? Yours is red, yours is green. Can you hear me, Lemis? Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's a bit risky. <laughs> I'm going to tell. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Is that better? Um, not everybody got a headset on, but if you have, are we good? Fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay. We're going to talk about recognition of prior learning, something I'm very passionate about. I absolutely love. Um, I'm going to make references to a few things and tell you where you can get the information, but the key is you can walk away from today knowing where to go and what to do if this is of interest to you or anybody in your family or friends or people you work with. Okay, so a little bit about me and I'll explain why the full page. So this is my aha uh -huh and ta-da moment. Um, a <laughs> little bit about me. <laughs> I've achieved a few things in life. We good? You get it? Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> why am I proud of showing you this? I'll show you why. You see that over there? I'm not going to use the laser because it won't show. The one in red. Now, how do you know if somebody studied at UCT? They tell you. <laughs> it's like, how do you know if somebody has an MBA? They'll tell you. The reason I'm really proud of everything that I've got there, but more important, Kevin, don't look at the dates. It might be inaccurate. <laughs> I was like, when was it again? But um, that in red is a postgraduate diploma in management from the University of Cape Town specializing in organizational development. Now, if you know anything about the academic system, you will know you cannot do a postgrad without an undergrad, right? And you cannot do an undergrad if you don't have good matric results, right? So would you believe me if I told you I finished school, I left school in grade 11? Come on. <laughs> now you want to know how I got that. Well, that's my RPL journey. So not only do I practice RPL in terms of what I do, I train trainers, I teach assessors how to assess RPL as well. I'm a product of RPL more than once. Cool. And I'm going to explain that journey to you, but without the RPL, so in other words, without my postgraduates, the accolades underneath with the experience, half of those wouldn't be there without the document that I had in my hand from UCT. That I can tell you for sure. And UCT wouldn't have been possible if SACWA, the South African Qualifications Authority, our, our government system didn't introduce RPL. I wouldn't have been where I am today and I wouldn't have been talking to you about it. Okay, I believe so much in it that even my son is a product of RPL. In a nice way. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so weird. 
Okay, so there's a bit of my information, but I'll give you all the ECASI information later. So this is the video I spoke about. Now on the previous slide, you saw me highlight the UCT qualification. Before I go in and explain how, how RPL works and what it means to everybody here, anybody who wants any form of qualification, the video is what was taken because of what I've done. Sorry, it's a lot of humming there. Because of what I've achieved in life, SACWA, the South African Qualifications Authority, in 2014 identified moi and asked me to speak at the RPL conference, the very first RPL conference in South Africa, with um, Sub-Saharan Africa joining. And they wanted to know about my journey introducing RPL at then the company I was working at, which was ETV or the eMedia Group. And um, at the same time, I was, um, had already achieved the um, recognition from UCT, and they wanted to know how I did that. So they made a video of a few people I'm featured on it, so you'll find the video on the SACWA website. So it is dated, I was smaller then, <laughs> blonder, <laughs> and um, I was then working for eMedia, but the context of how I got there is what the video is about. So it's about um, 11 minutes, I'm going to skip forward, in other words, just go to the next slide when I know that we're done with it. But again, if it's not too audible, then I will anyway jump over, just tell you what I've been saying. Are we good? So the video was, um, so it's narrated and the narrator has a beautiful voice, it's audible. The, the ex-CEO of SACWA, Joe Samuel, was a huge um, fan and an ambassador for recognition of prior learning, RPL. So he talks in the video, and I wanted to use that because of how his passion comes out. And he also, it's not just me in the video, it's other industries he talks about on various levels. So while you have your own interest for sitting here today, you probably are going to know a lot of people in a similar position to the other people that you see on the video. Okay, and you'll hear a little bit about how I struggle to get a job outside of the elementary positions that I was always finding because of my lack of education. Are we good? Okay, enjoy. I'm gonna have a seat while that plays. I'll sit here. Thank you. So you're feeling a bit more motivated now, a little bit more clarity. So let me explain the process, right? Are we good? Okay, what is RPL? You saw the video, right? The reality is that we all have work experience. The older we are, the more experience. Hopefully you have work experience. Maybe you have homework experience. But in order to achieve a qualification, you don't have to go through formal learning. The reality is that you can go to an educational institution and ask them to recognize your informal learning and turn it into a formal qualification. It's powerful stuff. Like I said, there is a myth, or there has been a myth about RPL until I guess I came along, and I now wear it with pride. It's powerful stuff. So re, um, receiving credit for work learned on the job, reading your research, it doesn't matter how you learned it. Outcomes-based education uh, teaches us and advises us that as long as you can achieve the outcome, you're entitled to the qualification. That's the gist of it. It doesn't matter how you got there. Okay. So why do we want to RPL? Well, there's a whole reasons. Firstly, RPL isn't a simple process that you can go to a, a university. I get calls a lot, a lot. Family, especially when they hear what I do, they don't quite get it. <laughs> and then they go, can you RPL me? I go, in what? Well, I've been selling houses and I'm like, yes. <laughs> so the answer is no, I can't, but somebody can. RPL is not to short um, cut the formal process of learning, it's to formalize what you have already learned on the job. So um, people, when they uh, get, when they ask for a meeting with an assessor, which I'll show you now the cycle, the first thing I would do as an assessor, and I've done quite a lot of RPL assessments, the first thing I ask is, why do you want to RPL? Now I don't have time to study. Well, then already I know where, where we're going here. Or um, I don't have the money for it. It's also not a shortcut, but in addition to that, yes, you probably pay less for an RPL, but it's not gonna be 10% of the fees. Um, I'll talk just now about what the costs are. Who are, uh, who are the people, so who can be RPL'd? 
pretty much anyone who meets the requirements of RPL. If you take any qualification currently listed on the SACWA um, National Learner Records Database, so if you go to sacwa.org.za and you click on the NQF, the National Qualifications Framework, they have over 100,000 qualifications and then part qualifications. The person who wants to apply for RPL has to find what they want to apply for because they already should be experts in that. That's what RPL is. So if somebody comes to me and says, I don't know what to be RPL, then that's not the person I help. I say to them, what have you done in your life? Have you studied anything? What work have you been doing? Oh, I've been doing this, I've been doing that, I've been doing this. And I mean, I was called in to a couple of high profile companies in South Africa to deal with certain individuals who didn't know what they wanted to be RPL then. And I would spend two to three hours per person coaching or guiding them in terms of, well, what is it you ultimately have been doing your whole life? So there's a difference between what I have been doing and where I want to be. I'm not there to tell you where you want to be in terms of a career change. I'm there to say, what can you formalize? And so any other assessor, as Lamise also is, and I don't know if there's any assessors in the room. So anyone who meets the, the RPL requirements, now Kevin, this is where I would turn and introduce you. The, the, in terms of RPL, we don't just get RPL for a qualification or a part qualification. We can be RPL for access, as the video showed. We can be RPL for access to university, which means somebody who didn't finish a matric, who wants to go to university, there's an access or an um, RPL access um, entry, and each, each university or tertiary establishment may have a different process and different requirements, but they must have that available for a person. The other access is not just to get into university, but if you've already studied, maybe those previous providers were not accredited. It's called legacy qualifications. Now you want to move forward and the current university, which is what happened to me with UCT, would not recognize what I'd studied through Damlin, which was prior to the National Qualifications Framework. So UCT accepted me on the postgraduate, which at the time was level seven, now level eight. For those that didn't know, Prior to 2009, I hope I have the date right, um, the NQF levels only went to eight. After that, the need arose to say, well, we need to differentiate between masters, well, your postgrad, your masters, and your doctorate. And so the levels went up to 10. So anything that pretty much was on a level um, six, seven, and eight might have moved up a tier. So when I studied at UCT, the postgrad was then a seven, it's now an eight, so I have a level eight. So when I applied to UCT, I had a qualification from Damlin that was relevant. They accepted me and only a few months into the program did they tell me, we can't continue with you on the program to achieve a postgraduate because you don't have an undergraduate. And I said, I beg your pardon, <laughs> like almost a year into the program, you're telling me this now. Um, and I wasn't the only one. We were a group of 40 people of which 20 sat in my position. So they said that was a legacy qualification, which is real. So I said, well, I have this. Long story short, I won the, the um, war, but I lost that battle. So I wrote to the services seat who actually paid for that postgrad for me to be on. And I said, you put me on this program telling me I was eligible. This establishment says I'm not, what now? So they paused me and the other 19 people and said, okay, we have to take a step back. All of you are gonna be RPL'd for access to gain entry onto the postgrad. Because of the system, and there's that gray area where it's, it's, um, it could be improved. I was doing exactly the same qualification as all 39 other people, all 40 of us. But because I didn't have the previous level to the extent that the university wanted it, I would walk away with an advanced certificate in leadership and half the class would walk away with a postgraduate, but we studied the same thing because the system says you need to climb. Now, if you know me, you'll know I'm a little bit of a rebel. I took it all the way to the top, <laughs> put it on hold, services he to agreed to pay for all of us for RPL. It meant it took me an extra two years of a, of a two year program. So it took me four years to achieve. But then, and that's what the video was about, that I was RPL'd for access to the postgrad. So even though I don't have a qualification for an advanced certificate in leadership, I put it on my CV because I'm proud of it. I have a certificate from UCT saying you were RPL'd for access 
and that's all I need. So technically, I could have got the qualification, so, you know, that's another battle. <laughs> but I could continue then on my postgrad journey, and I graduated in 2012. <laughs> so, but knowledge is power. I said this to a few people I've spoken to. Knowledge is power. So, who meets the requirements? So, Sakia in this case, and Kevin, if you could just put your hand up so those can see who you are. Kevin is the executive director for a professional body called the Southern African Communications Industries Association, Sakia. And if you want a professional designation, the normal requirements in any industry, if you study law, you go and um, do your bar exam, you have to work, you do your articles, whether you're an accountant, medical, right? But we've never had that in the communications or creative industries. Sakia is such a body that assists industry experts like yourselves, m myself, to get a professional professional designation which is normally based on a qualification, certain amount of years work experience equals a designation. When you have a professional designation, the world suddenly opens for you. I, I tell you that um, when you want to go and work in other places because you'd have to go to Saki and say, can I have a letter please? But in order to get that, people might say, but I didn't have the formal study. You go to SACA, you apply and say, can you RPL me? They look at, if there isn't a qualification, say, let's say, plus 10 years experience, do you have maybe 15 years experience with no qualification? They still interview you, put you through that assessment process, and you get your designation, which I also got through SACA. So what I'm saying is the CPD there just means validated. That means if you attend any program that Saki endorses, it counts towards you maintaining your professional designation. Speak to Kevin about that, and I've already connected some of you. But that's an, I wouldn't even say it's an alternative. I say still go for your qualification and still go for your designation. But if you have your qualification, then go for your designation um, to finish it off. Okay. So what is the National Qualifications Framework? On the screen in front, sorry, I keep looking to my left, but on the, <laughs> it's natural habit, but on the screen in front of you will see in the column on the left, it says education band higher, further and general. The second column says NQF levels. The third column says the type of qualification. And the last column says who are the typical institutions that would offer this information. So I've just given you a very brief sort of look at it, and the next slide is a bit more complex. But here you have, starting at an NQF level one, if you see an advert for a job, or anybody you know, and it says the person needs to have a minimum of an NQF level four, what the or equivalent is normally the add-on, what they mean is if you look there, an NQF level four is equivalent to having a matric, your national senior certificate. So if they say um, at least an NQF level seven, we know that they're looking for a four year degree um, and or your honors. Um, the master's is, uh, sorry, um, it scrolled down. So the master's is nine, the honors is seven. Can you see the top on the doctoral degree? That's basically um, 10. So master's nine, honors and, and fourth year eight, first degrees and so forth seven. Now. The um, university, depending on which university you go for, you might go to one and they have a degree at a level six, and then you could go to another one and they have it at a level seven. So be clear on what exactly you want to achieve, how much time you have to study, because the level that it's on will also equate to the amount of time that is spent. So be clear on that. When you go for an RPL, when you apply for an RPL, it could be for a full qualification, but it could be for part of a full qualification. So a qualification is subjects or modules, previously known as unit standards, that's in the process of changing with SACWA, but you don't have to go for a full qualification. Maybe you want one component and you've worked in the creative space and you've operated a camera and you just want camera operations, you're not worried about the qualification. You go to a training provider, in this case I know ECASI can certainly help, but you can go to a training provider who's accredited, say I want a recognition of prior learning only for camera operations and you can apply. It won't be as long as the RPL for a full qualification. It might take you 10 years, but by RPLing module by module, you could still get your qualification over time. That's the beauty of RPL. At your time when you want, and if you've earned the credit, it never disappears. It stays there. You might be asked to do a refresher if you haven't been current in that field. 
Okay, so those are the NQF levels. It starts at level one, which is pretty much equivalent to your grade nine. It goes all the way up to your 10. And when you look at a general education, that's your grade one, okay? So, uh, excuse me, your level one, which is your grade nine. But the moment you go up, you'll see levels two to four, it says further education. The old term that was used was an FET college, a further education and training college. It's now known as a TVET, Technical Vocational Education and Training College. It's pretty much when you study for a specific vocation. On this screen, the five to 10 says higher education, but it's a gray area like everything in, in life. Eh? So when we look at this, and I'm gonna move to this screen because it's closer, but when we look at this, you'll see the dark color of it at the bottom has level four, but on the end it shows five. Level five is in, gray, in a lighter color and it shows um, from five all the way to 10. There are three quality councils. That means in government, there are three quality councils, bodies that oversee education and training at the different NQF levels. Uma Lucy oversees from one to four, and the Council on Higher Education, CSE, is from five to 10. But in certain cases, and I'll get to QCTO now, in certain cases, the higher education says, we don't wanna deal with level five, even level six, go to the CETA. The QCTO is where the CETA comes in. The Quality Council, sorry for all the acronyms, I had to learn to speak Saccharinese over the last 20 years, but the Quality Council that handles vocational training will handle anything from an NQF level two all the way to, at this stage, level nine. So you could be RPL'd from a, a two pretty much to a nine through the QCTO if it's vocational studies. Garth, I'm looking at you because that's what I was saying earlier. That's so exciting. They will get to doctorate level, but for now it's two to nine, right? So if you want to apply to RPL, you need to make sure that the training provider is accredited with the right quality council to ensure you get the right qualification. Again, knowledge is power. So what is the process of assessment? The first thing that happens is you, you as a delegate or a candidate asked to be assessed, right? I've earned, and I'm saying you, it could be someone you know. You have worked in the industry, you know that you have the knowledge and the skill you want to be assessed. You ask to be assessed, that means that you have to apply to a training provider. ICASI has all of this on their website. There's a video where I talk about this process. I'm just explaining it again. Then the assessment is planned with the assessor. So you'll have an initial consultation. There is normally a fee depending on the provider and that fee will be deducted from your actual assessment fee if you go ahead with the program. But then it's planned and that's when the assessor spends time with you, sitting with you, determining based on the qualification or part qualification you've identified, they look at it and say, okay, you tell me how much you can do of this. It's not their job to tell you how much you can do, you must prove it to them. Only after that meeting do they say you are an eligible candidate, now we're gonna continue with it, and now you set out and you do the actual evidence collection. Now because it's an RPL, there's three types of evidence. Direct evidence, which means as an assessor, I would tell you, do it, I wanna see you perform. You say you can handle the camera, handle the camera. Direct evidence. Indirect might be where I tell you as the assessor, go and do the work, bring me back a portfolio, and that's normally what happens here, indirect. And the third type of assessment is historical. Now with RPL, we rely mostly on historical evidence because it's what you did before you came and knocked on the door to be assessed. That means you, it doesn't matter how you got there, the fact is you believe that you're eligible. So then the assessor sits with, so that could be practical, it could be theory, could be both, it could be workplace, it might not be workplace, it depends on what you're being assessed against. But either way, it has to be a subject matter expert assessing you. They shouldn't be registered as an assessor if they're not a subject matter expert. There are extreme circumstances, I know, because I was before, on something else I'm not an expert on, but that was just to, to train those people up. So here is the assessment of the portfolio. So the assessor then sits, and he or she or they would sit with a candidate, looking through their portfolio, watching the video, or them performing whatever they need to do, 
and they would then arrive at a competency judgment, which then means they either say you are found competent and they have the license to say I hereby will um, forward your, your results for moderation because I do find you competent or not yet competent. The reason it's called not yet competent is because you have the right to try again and try again. Now there's limits to everything. <laughs> I'm very mindful because this goes on YouTube. <laughs> People have asked me the question, do you find learners that are just not competent? <laughs> well, I don't know, do you? <laughs> so what I'm saying that is you shouldn't get to that point when you are RPL because the assessor should have determined that in the beginning. So you will find assessors turning people down for RPL, and I have. But once you get to that stage, now you've signed an agreement, it is your responsibility as an assessor to work with that learner to help them to be competent. I'm not saying they must train. Should the assessor find that the learner is lacking in a certain area, it should have been identified in the beginning. The assessor would then tell you, the candidate, you need gap training in this area or in this area, and therefore you then go and get that training, come back and say, yep, I've done it, and the assessment continues. So an assessment isn't a two-day thing, it's probably a year-long process, or depending on what you're being assessed against. So once the assessor has now said you are competent, it goes for moderation, which means another assessor, and uh, you must be an assessor to be a moderator, which is a higher level than an assessor, checks the assessor's work, says I'm in agreement with the assessor, or I overturn the decision. The moderator has the right to overturn an assessment. I am a moderator, I have overturned decisions, but I've never found a learner not yet competent ever in my life. Why? because I either go out of my way to help them to be competent, or I put the assessment on hold, tell them what to do, and come back. Yes, some people don't come back, but then it says pending, it doesn't say not yet competent. Because once they're not yet competent, it's a big red fail on your exam. Once the person sees that, they don't come back, and I don't want to do that. So it's a choice. There are assessors who can't wait to find the person not yet competent. They, they shouldn't be in that business. Okay, so that is the process. Once moderation takes place by an external moderator, that is when the CETA comes in, the quality council in this case, and they then verify the moderator's work, which means the third level, and once they are happy, a statement of results is issued, and a certificate is issued to the person. And now, like um, the video you saw, the person either walks away with a full qualification, and by the way, the qualification or part qualification you achieve may not say RPL at all. Unless it's a letter saying you were RPL, the qualification itself may not say you went through an RPL process. And if a provider is giving that to you, they're pretty much breaking the, well, SACWA's rules and, and laws. Because the person who achieves after RPL is just as worthy, if not more, than a person who's just studied. In fact, you've worked in the industry. Okay, I'm, I'm really set on that because it, it must not happen. So looking at the assessment after formal learning, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it. My slides will be available through ICASI on their site. But what I'm saying is when you assess after formal learning, you go through an exam, an examination process. You've had the learning probably with the same facilitator. They know what you're capable of and they summarize that all, right? But the assessment for RPL, you didn't have that learning with your assessor. If, uh, there wasn't a facilitator, so they need to ensure that the evidence they collect from wherever you've worked and whatever you've done, references and testimonies are the biggest part of this. Because it's you, as industry experts, getting feedback from people you've worked with or for, or people who've worked with you, and saying they did actually perform in this role, and this is what they did. Not, I didn't like them, they had an attitude problem, that bears a bit of relevance, but you know, it's more can they do the job and to what extent. Attitude counts, please don't get me wrong. So the criteria is exactly the same whether you are doing RPL or post, -le um, or post learning um, assessment, the criteria is the same. You see why your qualification is the same, eh? Okay, the job of the assessor is to make a judgment after looking at the evidence, irrespective of how you got there, okay? Gap training, I've already told you, sometimes that is needed. How do you go up, get RPL? There's 10 steps. Now, this is the 10 steps based on that cycle broken down a bit more. But again, I'm only showing you that it is on my slides, so we're going to wrap up soon. 
But um, the gist of it, sorry, the gist of it is that you're going to apply for RPL, but you must know what you're RPLing. Is it a program, a short course, in other words, a part qualification, or is it a full qualification? Is it for access? Did you know that you could RPL, if you left school and you didn't have a matric certificate or national senior certificate, did you know you could be RPL'd for access to university? Even if you didn't have, as you know with my story, a, a matric or university entrance um, exemption, should I say. So anybody can actually be accessed. So it's happening a lot. Now the matric um, access is more done by the younger people who leave school uh, three, four years later, say, I do want to study. And instead of rewriting their matric, they ask for access or RPL because they want to study. A lot of the universities and technicons offer the RPL program to them. Okay. So this is again just the text um, formalizing what I'd already told you. What is important about that is to note that the POE, the portfolio of evidence, no matter what, whether it's assessment after learning or whether it's um, assessment for RPL, you will always submit a portfolio. So either way, there's homework. That's the gist of what I'm saying. People come to me, can I just pay you and you give me? Like, no. And when I just became assessor, I was, um, so I'm an assessor and a moderator and I've verified and I'm a designer and a coach, so I've done all the work, you know, credits it. But somebody said to me after doing the assessor program, just be careful, you're going to understand what an Egyptian handshake is. And I didn't understand what they meant. And they stood like this. And I was like, I don't understand. And they said, people are gonna tell you, they'll give you that, but they want that. <laughs> so never, so my policy, don't assess family and close friends if you can help it, or do it, but be transparent. So I did assess my, my family, my kids, because they were in the industry but I got somebody else to moderate all their portfolios because I wanted transparency. It costs a bit more. Okay, what are the costs? There isn't a fixed cost to RPL. It differs from a, um, provider to provider. You could probably expect up to 50% of the actual cost of the program, up to, but it depends on the amount of work required. So the higher up you go, the more the costs are gonna be. Um, I have RPLs, Part qualification, my costing would, uh, the first thing I'll say is how many credits. <coughs> Excuse me. If you see on a qualification, there's a credit value. Some of you might have seen this. It would say 10 credits or 120 credits. Just for your purposes to plan, one credit of a qualification, one credit is equal to 10 notional hours, which means if a qualification is 120 credits, that's 1,200 hours that the learner would have spent towards becoming competent in the outcome. So if you want to be found competent on a four-year degree, that would probably be a 480 credit program. That's 4,800 hours. As an assessor, they need to find the evidence for that 4,800 hours. Are you getting me? So that's why I'm saying some people revert to just do 10 credits for now, please. Okay, so my costing will be based on the NQF level and the credits, because then I know how complex the program's gonna be. Does that give you a bit more guidance? Okay, and of course, negotiate. We're all gonna do that. I mean, I'm unemployed. <laughs> I give it back to you. I'll train for you for free. I've heard it all. I'm negotiable. <laughs> Ekasi will speak. Okay, RPL is not a, sh so it's almost in closing, but RPL's not, Entitlement. It's not to say I was um, disadvantaged and therefore I should be qualifying. It, it's not that. It's I was disadvantaged, I had the experience, and I should be qualified. You get me? Okay. So it's I've earned it. People um, can't claim I've been, um, somebody was asking me the question earlier. You can't take your CV and say, yeah, I want to be RPL'd. We scrutinize that CV and the references, and trust me, we check those references. <laughs> People give reference letters from family members, and then I know how to ask questions, and then I phone and go, you've worked with this person, what did they do for you? No, they were actually a boom swinger, they also did a bit of camera, they even edited. I go, that's fantastic. I don't say, are you? I say, how are you related to them? Oh, it's my niece. <laughs> I go, okay. I'm just saying, because now you start interrogating a bit more. You have to. When that person walks away as an assessor, you have given them a license, like your drivers, to go out there and tell the world they've earned it. I would be embarrassed to put that behind my name if I haven't done due diligence. Okay. And you are so proud when you qualify after RPL because you worked for it. So I'm a tough one, but I'm a fair assessor. Ikasi can tell you. Eh? All right. So 
This is my end. Thank you for your indulgence. I'm saying who is the most awesome person because this is the first step in the right direction of your RPL journey. I did it. I, my salary include, <laughs> increased tenfold after my RPL. That's what you want to hear. Eh? Yep, I earned a lot more money after showing my piece of paper. Now I'm back to nothing. <laughs> that cycle of um, Maslow's hierarchy. But what I'm saying is it's such a powerful feeling. It's so amazing to have. This is where I say we have questions. I know that Swift is having the meeting if they can indulge us for about five or so minutes. I see there's not a lot of people here yet. Is that cool? Are we okay, Landy? Just for questions, thank you very much. Ikasi has a lot of, um, I'll thank you very much. I acknowledge Kevin. I acknowledge, thank you, Aldred. Was your hand up? Not yet. You're gonna hear what they, thank you, Lind it's Lindsay, hey, yeah. <laughs> so this is the contact info, I'll leave it on. The most important thing is ikasimedia.com. You will find a video of me talking about RPL. They are a not-for-profit, so if the company you're working for wants you to RPL and they prepare to pay, they can even get a tax certificate because it's a not-for-profit, yay. <laughs> so there's so many benefits to doing it. But if you are an unemployed person as a freelancer, you can still speak to Ikasi because um, they will be going, I say they because I represent you today, but they will be going to mix CETA, MRCTC to do apply for funding to assist freelancers to formalize the education by applying for an actual qualification. With that said, of course, with a professional designation, you could do exactly the same with Kevin, um, with Sakia that is. So please do speak to him, Aldred, um, also representative of Sakia. So that's pretty much it. So. Um, I'll leave it there so you can take photos. Kevin, you first question. Yeah, so it's, it's not so much a question. I wanted to just support what you were saying, particularly in terms of the portfolio of evidence, because uh, we do a lot of assessments from people uh, wanting to earn a professional designation and they don't have the underlying qualifications. Yeah. And as you said, <laughs> you know, they'll send you a copy of their CV. Um, and, and I have to tell you that the biggest challenge that I have uh, assessing individuals that want to earn a professional designation based on RPL is that their supporting documentation embedded within what they consider to be a portfolio of evidence is complete garbage. Yeah. Um, so, so I yeah. would really just share, if, if I could share a word of advice, it would be to say, if you're not gonna take it seriously yeah. and prepare a decent portfolio of evidence with verifiable uh, letters of commendation from people that you've worked with. Uh, just uh, don't even bother starting. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. Uh, either take it seriously or don't bother doing it. Sure. Uh, I also just thought to mention that one of the other things that's important, and I, I'm not sure if there are any foreign nationals in the, in the audience, um, but one of the things that's required when foreign nationals are applying for a residence permit using a, a, a critical skills visa yes. is that they need to go through an assessment uh, and again this is one of the areas where RPL can assist people um, in securing a, a permanent residence permit but again there has to be an in-depth assessment that allows us to determine whether the person has the skills yeah. that they are claiming to have. Perfect. Um, you know, we, I probably assess, in terms of particularly a critical skills assessments, probably somewhere around five or six a year. Uh, and most of them are quite good. Um, but I regularly get people, particularly claiming competence as a multimedia producer, mm -hmm. which is one of the, the critical skills that uh, appears yeah. on the critical skills list. Uh, and, and when I start digging a little deeper, uh, they've got some great testimonial letters written by their dad and mm -hmm. their uncle, and uh, you yeah. know, it's just complete garbage. So just if I could share that as an insight. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much, Kevin. I, um, I know exactly what he's talking about. People the same way try to come into the country to offer their services and say that they have scarce or critical skills. It's also the professional body's responsibility to approve or decline their application. So you, you want to know Sakia. <laughs> and they have three levels, the um, associate, practitioner, and professional levels. So depending on your levels of expertise, but please do speak to them. It's, it's really awesome to have. 
Thank you, Kevin, for that. Aldred, you? Thanks, Natasha. Ah. It's okay. I'll be Natasha today. <laughs> I'll be, that's I don't you. know where that came from. It's okay. Uh, you want me to be a... Thanks for the presentation, yeah. Natalie. Um, so if a candidate wants to apply for a job and they have... Let's say the requirement is NQ level 8. Yes. They've got 7 and they've got more than enough work experience and skill to do that job. Is there a way to, to prove to that company that you're applying for that um, you qualify for a NQF level 8? Is there a way around sure. that? Uh, Thank you, Aldred. So th there is the reality sometimes that the company already knows who they want to hire and therefore sometimes the job is written for them. So it's the higher they go up, the more difficult it becomes. So that is a reality we can't sort of do anything about. But if the company says that they want an um, SACWA Inc. of level eight, we now know they want your postgraduate or your honors, right? Let's say you are embarking on it. You could say to them, which I've done for other people to help them. They were working in the job the company said they can't work for them anymore because the requisite of the job is a certain NQF level. The person could prove to them they were studying it and they would be finished it within, say, the year. They gave them the grace, allowed them to, to get the job or to, to continue with the job on the basis they finished within a certain period. It's a negotiation. I tell you, after doing thousands of interviews in my life, I'm not exaggerating, if that job said NQ of level eight and you came in and motivated to that extent, I would love that fact, unless it was a legal requirement, I would consider that motivation. You with me? But then I have to consider it for everybody else who comes with that excuse or that reasoning and motivation. Okay, but if you do enroll with the university, they can give you a letter to say you have enrolled for say an NQ of level nine, but that you have been found competent at a level eight. I mentioned to you I have a certificate. It's a piece of paper from UCT that says Natalie has completed an RPL process allowing her to enter NQF level eight, which meant I'd applied, I'd comfortably um, achieve level seven. I, I put it on my CV, I'm that proud of it. But you see, I know what it means. And when they ask, I end up in an interview educating my interviewers. You know, control the interview, eh? <laughs> Okay, over to you, Lindsay. One, first, Lindsay, yeah. and then I'll end with you if there's no more questions, okay? Are we good? So I've got yes. my, my question is sort of twofold yes. because I, I tried to go through the RPL process um, a couple of years ago. Yes. Um, and at the time, my aim and my intention was to do my MBA. Okay. Um, but I hadn't, finished my I, I hadn't finished my degree. I did one or two years of my degree at the time. Okay. And when I tried to, you know, just skip ahead and go straight to MBA and have myself RPL because I've been working for about 20 years. Um, I was told by the institution that I can't skip so many levels. I would have to have either a degree first yes. um, or oh. honors or something before yeah. I go to MBA. So I wanted to ask that. But then also the other question is, now that I have my degree, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to have myself RPL honors so that I can, do you know, go do my masters. But now, it, exactly as you said in the video, you know, there's su such misinformation because mm. some some people don't really understand the process themselves Correct. when you phone the institutions. Oh yes. And I was told by one of the people that I that I had inquired from that now that I have my degree, I have to wait five years, I have to go and work for five years. And I said, I've been working for mm. 20 years. Mm. Why are you telling me to go and work for another five mm. years before I can better. RPL yeah. myself? So I just wanted to kind of understand whether that is the sure. truth or whether, you know. So um, I just want to pause are. quickly. Thank you. Lin um, Linda, you can tell the ladies to come in. I'm just getting the last question. You can shuffle. I will take questions offline on the side. I'm also here yes, Swift are having their members get together. If you are a member of Swift or want to be a member of Swift, stick around. To answer Lindsay, and this might be for all of your purposes, um, that's nonsense, the second part of the question. You've already worked. You don't even need the degree to get the honors, depending on the institution. People answer because they don't know. Most of my life has been about educating the training provider so when I assisted my son to be RPL, he'd been doing sound engineering for 12 years. He wanted an RPL because he learned on the job. They said, no, they can't do it. 
I phoned them and said, why not? No, we don't have a policy. I said, I'll write it for you. Because that's what I do. I wrote it for them. And then I said, now go and roll it out. And then they were like, how do we do this? Like, oh my word. But I could pave the way for others. Knowledge really is power. And my entire life, even with my RPL, I had to educate as I went along. I took that university on and the CETA on and, and look where I am today because knowledge is power. So you can go to SACWA and say to them on their hotline, this is the answer I'm getting. They will take it up with an institution, but be clear on what it is you're asking for. And you know me, phone me, WhatsApp me, Nats. I might answer a day later, but <laughs> I have a lot of people WhatsApping me with that. Okay, last question, please, and then we need to go, but I will be at the back and you can ask questions. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. You're I was welcome. even willing yeah, to go straight to the back. Good afternoon. Uh, the name is Andy. So my question, and I feel a little bit shy to ask it no, now, don't after be. you talked about multimedia <laughs> <laughs> producers, oh, but I've been working in the social media space for more than 10 years, yes. and um, I've been recently on yes. an education journey just trying to um, nice. see what I can do. I've done a PG dip in general management. I did a degree wow. and a PG dip, and I want to go, um, you know, a little bit further, yeah. and more so in skills um, training and development. And I will reach out to Ikasi's um, team. Beautiful. But my question is, you know, um, with the years of experience that I have in, if I may call sure. it a niche, social sure. media, which is relatively new, I haven't found a qualification that's aligned to exactly what I've been doing for the past, you know, eight to ten years, um, and so I feel. I'm, I, I feel like I should be RPLing something that I've done, sure. um, but also, you know, even in masters, I'm not too sure what to take forward um, in the space that I'm in. So, yeah, sure. I have been, yeah. Thank you, Andiswa, and congratulations on getting this far. And that is something, and thank you so much for raising that, because the reality is that there are quite a few things that aren't registered. Like a few years back, I helped one of the companies I was consulting with to register for a learnership, or excuse me, an internship in virtual reality or in um, artificial intelligence or augmented reality. You can imagine the fight we had with the system we didn't understand. Everything can be negotiated, you just need to know. So you can say, Nats, I'm reaching out here, where do I go? But yes, um, there are avenues. One of the avenues are looking at a few of the shorter courses, putting them together and saying, I have a collection of these in the absence of a formal qualification. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your patience, Swift. Thank you for your indulgence. I hope you've learned today. <laughs> I can get off now. <laughs> thank you.